Anytime, anywhere. ABC News Now. Start here. And what you can do for your country. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Hello and welcome to Time Tunnel, where we find out what was making news in the past. I'm Daljit Daliwal in New York, and today we travel back to this day in 1976. And here's Ted Koppel. From New York, this is ABC News. Now, Ted Koppel. Good evening. President Ford and Ronald Reagan were both in Florida today. They didn't see each other, but did see a lot of voters. We have reports starting with ABC White House correspondent George Watson. Compared with his usual low-key style, President Ford hit Florida like a hurricane this weekend. He barnstormed through five cities and, for the first time, battered his Republican opponent, Ronald Reagan. The middle of the road philosophy is the right philosophy for the United States. And anyone on the right or on the left of my uh, philosophy just can't win because most Americans believe in a moderate, middle of the road philosophy. Do you put Ronald Reagan in that category? I'll let the American people make that decision. Thus branding Reagan as a radical, the president then concentrated on winning votes for himself as a moderate. One-third of Florida's voters classify as senior citizens, and so President Ford paid court to old folks in a St. Petersburg park. He encountered large and friendly crowds along the way, including a woman who knew him way back when. Jerry, do you know me? I sat behind you at the University of Michigan 35. Again, taking issue with Reagan indirectly, the president promised to pursue detente and salt talks with the Soviet Union. We're going to make sure and positive that it's a fair agreement. And your president is going to be a tough Yankee trader when he sits down, if he does, in trying to negotiate any such agreement. The president turned out the biggest and most enthusiastic crowd on a festival day in Fort Myers. The police chief estimated 50,000 people lined the motorcade route. As a moderate conservative, he criticized Congress for its free spending ways. I have vetoed 47 bills, which uh, by the latest tabulation means that we have spent ten and a half billion dollars less than we would have spent because 38 or 39 of them have been sustained. Tonight in Miami, the president is making a tough law and order speech demanding for the first time as president the death penalty for certain murderous crimes. But clearly his campaign strategy is now to brand Ronald Reagan as a radical rightist who can't win and to portray himself as the cool chief of the moderate middle. George Watson, ABC News, with the president in Florida. This is Betsy Aaron in Eustis, Florida. Ronald Reagan's answer to Gerald Ford is simple. Conservatives get elected. The proof? He did twice in California, where he picked up the governor's prize in a state with a better than three to two Democratic population. That said, Reagan turned to picking up primary votes in central Florida. This his sixth trip to the state. The man who wants to go to Washington telling a now familiar tale. I believe that the governor, or the president, of the United States is what Harry Truman called him. He is the people's lobbyist in Washington. He's the only one there that was elected by all the people. And for that reason, I think that the president, uh, since Franklin down under Roosevelt, whether you agreed with him or not, he did the one thing that is needed doing, that at least the president communicate with the people, that the president take his problems and the problems of the country over the heads of the Congress and tell the people of this country the truth about our situation and what it is he's proposing to do about it. Reagan's people readily admit that presidential visits to their state certainly helped Gerald Ford. But if you believe Tommy Thomas, Reagan's campaign manager, and a man not given to dealing in subtleties, Reagan is going to run away with the March 9th primary by a two-to-one margin. And when you think you've got a margin that large, candidate Reagan can afford to lose a few votes to President Ford. Betsy Aaron, ABC News, with the Reagan campaign in Florida. The Vietnam News Agency said today that a counter-revolutionary uprising was put down in Saigon yesterday. 
The Vietnamese say the rebels were connected with the CIA, but a State Department spokesman denied any CIA involvement. The Vietnamese say the rebels were using a Catholic church as a stronghold. Security forces surrounding the church allegedly came under fire, and they retaliated. The Vietnam News Agency says everyone involved was captured after a 13-hour battle. President Frangia of Lebanon today told his countrymen that Christians and Muslims will be equally represented in Parliament. Christians by law used to be guaranteed a 55% majority. It was one of several political reforms aimed at satisfying Muslim demands, demands that helped fuel 10 months of civil war. That war is over, but ABC's Jerry King reports that feelings in post-war Beirut still run high. Life in the predominantly Muslim suburbs of Maslak and Carantina was always a struggle. These pictures were filmed prior to the January round of Beirut civil war, during which life here became impossible to live. On January 18th, the shantytown slums of Carantina and Maslak were attacked by right-wing Christian militias. Such as they were, the homes of the Kurdish and Palestinian residents were then bulldozed. Since the ceasefire, Carantina has been the scene of a macabre scavenger hunt, with other refugees and neighborhood people salvaging anything usable. I'm told the debris is to be scooped up, taken out to sea, and dumped into the Mediterranean. Scores of people died here, but as yet there is no exact death toll of men, women, and children. Those who escaped, some 6,000, are now housed in temporary quarters in three middle-class seaside resorts. This one has been nicknamed the New Carantina Beach Club. They are being cared for by the Palestinian guerrilla group Al-Fatah with the help of volunteer social workers. Although conditions are still overcrowded and the people still underprivileged, this is better than Carantina was or could be but it's not home. Most brought with them the clothes on their backs and vengeance in their hearts. This woman told me right as snipers shot her husband, her pregnant oldest daughter, and her granddaughter as they tried to flee Carantina. She says the attackers confiscated jewelry from both the survivors and the dead. It's a tale similar to ones told by Christian refugees, with only the roles reversed. There's talk Carantina will be rebuilt, but nobody knows when. The Christians of Demur, demolished by the Palestinian commandos, face the same uncertainties and harbor the same grudges. There are tens of thousands on both sides. Besides the obvious problems associated with its refugees, Lebanon must curb their desire for revenge against those who drove them from their homes. Either that or acknowledge it will probably have to live with tit-for-tat violence and killing for some time to come. Jerry King, ABC News, Beirut. Israeli forces in the Sinai were joined today by United Nations soldiers starting an operation that will end next week when Israel gives up a five-mile-wide buffer zone. It's part of the interim agreement worked out by Secretary of State Kissinger late last summer. In return, the Egyptians promised not to try to settle the Middle East conflict by force. There are growing signs today inside China that Deng Xiaoping is in trouble. Only last December, Deng was President Ford's official host in Peking, the man who appeared to be running China's affairs. But wall posters clearly directed against Deng Xiaoping cropped up earlier this week at Peking University, have now appeared at a second university in Peking and in Shanghai. All of this in the wake of Deng's removal from office a week ago today. We asked Hong Kong Bureau Chief Ken Kashiwahara to put into perspective the confusing developments of the past few days inside China. Meet Wa Guofeng, the man who was virtually unknown outside China a week ago, and the man who has now become the symbol of the unexpected political shuffle taking place in Peking. Wa is the new acting premier of China. He had been the country's top policeman. He is believed to be a staunch disciple of Mao Zedong, and during the past year has been one of the fastest rising stars on Peking's political horizon. Still, no one expected Hua to be appointed acting premier. Zhou Enlai's old job, so China experts thought, would automatically go to Deng Xiaoping, the man who was hand-picked by Zhou, the man who dealt with President Ford, and the man who was chosen to deliver the all-important eulogy at Zhou Enlai's funeral. So, what happened? Well, there has been no lack of theories. Deng Xiaoping, according to Wan, has suffered a setback in his efforts to become the new premier. But another theory has him voluntarily stepping aside in favor of a younger man, but still remaining in control. One theory even has Deng being saved for the chairman's job after Mao dies. 
But even though China has yet to confirm which theory is the right one, there have been hints that perhaps Deng's moderate faction has lost ground to the radicals, headed by Chang Jing, Mao's wife. Peking newspapers, for example, printed an article blasting unnamed high-ranking leaders who are leaning toward capitalism. Deng Xiaoping was accused of that same crime during the Cultural Revolution. And more recently, the radicals claimed apparent victory in the continuing education debate. They want to keep the education process pure in the revolutionary sense by rewarding students based on devotion to communist ideology rather than on scholastic ability. The moderates, including Deng Xiaoping, see that system hurting China's intellectual development and in turn the country's scientific and technological advancement. The meaning and extent of Peking's new developments are far from clear yet. One top Chinese communist source here told me his theory is that it is all part of the collective succession process, that instead of grooming younger men like Wa Guofeng for the premier's job, the idea now is to actually put him in the job and guide him from the sidelines. But true or not, Peking is going to have to bring it all into focus pretty soon. China is no longer isolated behind the Great Wall, but now has ongoing relationships with the rest of the world. Deng Xiaoping has not been seen or heard from in nearly a month, and the United States, for one, is surely going to want to know whether the words he uttered to President Ford on China's behalf still hold true or not. Ken Kashiwahara, ABC News, Hong Kong. Nigeria's military leaders today named the Army Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Obasanjo, to take over as head of state. He succeeds General Mohammed, who was shot to death yesterday in an abortive coup by dissident members of the armed forces. Reports from Africa attributed to senior Western intelligence sources say Soviet naval guns shelled one southern Angolan port city for two days before landing hundreds of Cuban troops there on Thursday. In Washington today, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld told reporters he doesn't think that Congress will oppose future requests for military aid the way it opposed aid to Angola. That, says Rumsfeld, was an overreaction to our involvement in Vietnam. The Tenneco Corporation, which deals in oil and natural gas, said today that since 1970 it has made payments that may have been illegal to candidates and local officials in at least 10 states. Tenneco also told the Securities and Exchange Commission that it paid $10,000 to an official of an unnamed foreign government. Tenneco said it is voluntarily turning its records over to the Internal Revenue Service. CBS Newsman Daniel Shore admitted last night that he supplied the copy of that House Intelligence Committee report published earlier this week by New York's weekly newspaper Village Voice. Shore would not say where he got the report. CBS says it is backing Shaw's decision to protect his sources, but says it is removing him from covering the controversy surrounding the report. For most Americans, emergency medical service is available around the clock. But in her letter to ABC News, Lois Davis of San Bernardino, California, pointed out that medicine for our pets is not always nearby when it's needed. We asked pet and wildlife expert Roger Karras to look into the matter, and he has this Saturday close-up report. Her electrocardiogram seems to be normal in all respects. Her access is normal now. The Animal Medical Center in New York City is the largest and one of the most advanced veterinary medical hospitals in the world. Very importantly, it is opened and staffed 24 hours a day. 25,000 emergencies are seen here each year, 110 of them on some weekend evenings alone. Not every city has this kind of round-the-clock service, and it is true that pets die needlessly as a result. In other cases, they die because owners have not been informed in advance and do not know what is available. An electronic answering machine is poor consolation when a dog is hemorrhaging or a kitten strangling on a sliver of bone. Dr. William Kay, chief of staff of the Animal Medical Center, explains one aspect of the problem. The cost of developing a facility like this is enormous, and there are not enough veterinarians and there are not enough veterinary schools at this time to maintain such facilities. They cannot be staffed, and this facility has lost several million dollars, and they are almost invariably, to provide this kind of service, uh, losing operations. A typical emergency is a bitch unable to give birth unaided. We called here and the doctor told us to bring her right in, that she probably needed assistance in her delivery. Dog owner, how do you feel about having a place that's open all night? I 
thank God. I thank God because I think I was going to take a heart attack. I was a nervous wreck. We couldn't come fast enough. He drove and God knows how we got here, but we did. It's just total wrecks. The most important thing is to be prepared for an emergency. First, pet owners should check with their local veterinary societies, city or state, and find out where emergency facilities are located. Very often the police can, if necessary, guide pet owners to night veterinary services if they exist. We'd like to admit her to the hospital, and we'd like to probably take some x-rays of her back. For many people, for many reasons, night can be on an easy time. Things can go wrong, and the amenities and securities of the daylight hours have a way of vanishing. With a sick or injured pet, blood and pain can be even more terrifying at night. In those cities where they exist, an all-night emergency veterinary hospital can be a haven and a blessing indeed. Roger Karras, ABC News, New York City. If you have an idea for Saturday Close-Up, we'd like to know about it. Please send it to Saturday Close-Up, 7 West 66th Street, New York, 10023. At the Winter Olympics in Innsbruck today, the American hockey team missed its chance for a bronze medal, losing to West Germany 4-1. The Soviet team beat Czechoslovakia for the gold medal. With the Olympic Games ending, ABC's Peter Jennings reports that somewhere between the original ideal and the practical reality, something has been lost. The modern Olympics were revived, said their founder, for a number of reasons having to do with sports and good fellowship. They were not, he insisted, a place for people just to win medals, nor certainly a place to demonstrate the superiority of one political system over another. When the five-ringed Olympic flag fluttered to its position of honor here, the symbolic links between sporting peoples of five continents seemed distressingly remote. Many athletes, including Americans, were absent. They or their coaches had thought it more important to train or rest than swear the Olympic oath. The game's defenders argue that athletes from various nations interrelate for the time that they're here. True, but to a very limited extent. In the Olympic Village, the one place where they could mix regularly, athletes acknowledge that it is easier to stick with one's own kind. Pressure from coaches, and in the case of communist nations officials too, discourages anything more than a pleasant hello. With many nations, especially those with a chance to win, rampant nationalism has made athletes' names less important than the nations. It can be seen most easily in the events which require judging. In figure skating, almost without exception, judges mark their own skaters higher. You can hear it in the crowd reaction, see it in the athletes' faces, as here, when an American girl, whose parentage allowed her to skate for Holland, got a decent mark from every judge except the American. Judge number two. The spectator is not immune from nationalism. Not altogether surprising, but Austrians admit that had their man not won the downhill skiing, in Austria it would have been a day of mourning. American hockey fans here, they remember when Russia won in basketball, seem to see hockey as an extension of the Cold War on ice. The American attitude about winning is a forceful one. No one who loses becomes a non-person, but medals are important to the national status. Michael Harrigan of the President's Commission on Sport. I don't think there's any doubt that the American people want to win. The American people want to make sure their best teams are here. And if we win, fine. If we lose, so be it. But make sure we have our best teams here. Anyone making the foregoing observations can be accused of lacking reality. True again. It is highly unlikely that in a largely nationalist world, the games could remain a festival of life and sport. It is just that in being little more than a reflection of life, the game's weaknesses seem even starker. Peter Jennings, ABC News, at Innsbruck in Austria. There are those who argue that in an open society like ours, nothing should be concealed from the public. Depending on who espouses it, that position is either cynical or naive. Clearly, the public's right to know will frequently conflict with the individual's right to privacy. And so mature and rational citizens soon recognize that neither absolute privacy nor absolute openness is achievable. The dilemma of CBS newsman Daniel Shaw is a case in point. Mr. Shaw took the position that the public was entitled to see the full text of the House Intelligence Committee report. First, he revealed all the substantive material in the report on CBS radio and television. ABC and NBC News did much the same. But Mr. Shaw also arranged for the report to be published in full 
by a New York weekly newspaper, The Village Voice. And this he tried to do anonymously. By his actions, Mr. Shaw rejected the administration's claim to secrecy and the congressional vote to honor that claim. That was his privilege. But now that his anonymity has been shattered, ironically by the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, Mr. Shaw is crying foul because he's quoted as saying, there are delicate matters involved that journalists should want to protect in their common interest. If Mr. Shore is saying that there are some confidences that should not be violated, even in an open society, I think he may be onto something. I'm Ted Koppel in New York. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. This has been ABC News. And that's all the time tunnel that we have for you today. So let's get you back to the present now with ABC News Now.